Welcome back to Stories from the Ashes, where we pontificate on good books and the stories that define and refine us. I'm Amber, and I'm here with Amanda and our special guest, Kelly Froislin. Kelly, welcome. Why don't you go ahead and tell us just a little bit about yourself and how many kids you have, if you guys homeschool or not, what part of the country you live in? Sure, yeah. So we have seven children, and we've homeschooled always. Um, We started with Ambleside Online back 10 plus years ago and have stuck with it all the way through. We're in, uh, we're currently in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, My husband is working toward ordination with the Anglican Diocese here. So that's what we're doing here. Very fun. So you are a member of our Reshelving Alexandria community. And I have to tell you, um, I have a really hard time with faces and names, especially on Facebook, because people's profile pictures are constantly changing. Mm. And especially for the people who like leave the same picture for years and then change it. I'm like, you're a stranger. <laughs> I have no idea who you are. So I first started recognizing you as an individual person and tying your thoughts and ideas together when you started sharing the pictures of your dining room table. Oh, yeah. It was the most like fantastically long table with all the lovely bookshelves behind it. And it just looked so inviting. And yes, so... it's been an inspiration to many, I think. <laughs> I started traveling around the internet. I started seeing other people having similar setups and them saying, yeah, I saw your pictures. So I share it often because um, like we have a big family, so we need that huge long table. And we were able to kind of combine that's actually the name of my business is hearth room that was kind of the idea was the the books and the eating and the kitchen all kind of in the one space together as a family so that's cool. yeah that's how you remember me yeah. <laughs> it's actually amber, from the space yeah yeah amber told me that we were interviewing you and i was i wasn't sure who you were but then she told me the person with the dining room and i was like oh yeah <laughs> i know that's funny oh my goodness <laughs> i always think people will know who i am because i never shut up about handbook of nature study but that's funny the dining room <laughs> yeah so speaking of handbook of nature study that was the second thing that i started recognizing you in the group about was when you started sharing sharing the notebooks that you found mm. of Anna Botsworth Comstock. And I've seen on Instagram that you call her ABC, which is mm. really cute. Um, but <laughs> do, you, do you want to tell us a little bit about just who she is so that we understand sure. why what you found was exciting? Right. Okay. So Ambleside, the curriculum that we used, uses the Handbook of Nature Study as kind of the foundational science curriculum. Um, and when um, she was... So Anna Comstock wrote the Handbook of Nature Study, and it's this humongous volume of, um, I have it here somewhere, I have one of these oldies. It's like a thousand pages. And so uh, a lot of people, a lot of mothers in the community of Ambleside Online are very intimidated by it. And so, and myself included, I was using it all wrong in the beginning. But I will say as a, kid, as a kid, I was highly intimidated by it because my mother didn't use it, but my, wow. aunt, my aunt did. And I remember being at her house and seeing that black reprint mm. and going like, oh, I'm so glad she's not the one homeschooling me because I thought that was just like, they just like sat down and read straight through it and it looked so overwhelming. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's comprehensive. <laughs> so, mm. um So Anna Comstock was this pioneer kind of in her field, and um, she was one of the first female professors at Cornell, and she was professor of nature study. And um, well, I know I'll bring up Liberty Hyde Bailey a lot. Um, He was kind of the uh, head of, he was the dean of the agricultural school there, and he was kind of the like source of how all of the nature study stuff got started. And she was part of his team. So it was uh, him, and her, and then John Spencer, who was, um, he was not a professor, he was just a farmer. And the three of them kind of as a team got together and decided that they were going to focus on educating teachers and really focusing on, so Liberty Hyde Bailey was a horticulturist, agriculturist. Um, Anna Comstock worked as an artist and uh, her husband was an entomologist. And then John Spencer was a farmer. So Bailey was able to get funds from the government back when Cornell was first getting its agricultural school uh, going, he was able to be the person to kind of be the bridge between getting the state to pay for a lot of things. And so once the state started giving them money, they were able to hire more people, including Anna Comstock, to go do these projects. And so 
the handbook of nature study is just kind of her um, way of kind of getting all the stuff together that she wanted teachers to have at, at hand so that they could teach nature study. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, so yeah, I know. that's awesome. So what were her projects? You mentioned her projects. Her projects. Um, so she would go around to public schools and try to convince the teachers to adopt nature study as part of their curriculum. And um, this was like a huge uphill battle because they were already very overwhelmed. You'll read in her uh, introductory chapter, she uses um, lacerated nerves and like how um, stressed out and maxed out these teachers already were. And she really like, it's interesting because I think a lot of people think of her as very like scientific or um, she's kind of sassy and um, strict, I guess you would think, but she actually really had a heart for the teachers and she wanted them to adopt this as like um, care for themselves and something they could really enjoy and a rest for them. And then also, Mm -hmm. you know, something that would bond the teacher and the student as well. So um, her work was really just going around to public schools and trying to help teachers see the benefit. That's really beautiful. she, She really wanted to make nature study easier and accessible. Not yeah, and it, I think with nature study, hi, Eva. This is my um, daughter. She's not supposed to be down here, but she, <laughs> can you go back upstairs? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to talk about your favorite nature study books, okay? Um, so what was I saying? Um, she wanted to make it easy and accessible. Okay, yeah, so that's nature study. That's kind of what happened with the public school was trying to, like, merge these two ideas, uh, you know, these rigid wooden ideas at school. And then this like kind of spiritual, um, poetic, beautiful love for nature was, it's hard to mesh those two things. And so that was really kind of her goal was to um, encourage the teachers and now parents that nature study is enough to get the children into, you know, we're, we're so concerned that our children, especially homeschoolers, I know for me, it's like you're worried that your children are not up to standard or that they're not going to perform well in college and that kind of stuff. And she was really trying to say, it's enough. Your children can specialize later and they probably will mm-hmm. if you just give them the time to love it first. Right. Mm-hmm. I agree. That's yeah. awesome. So what you found then were some of the consumable products that yes, had just yeah. been consumed. And so people weren't really seeing them when you started sharing a couple of the notebooks you had found asking if anyone else had any, no one did in our large right. group and no one had right. seen them. Can you tell us about the consumables? Yeah. So, um, and actually I, after the fact had um, last, I don't remember when it came out, but recently someone had written not written, but um, her name's uh, Karen St. Peters, I think. And she was a student at Cornell currently who um, researched Anna Comstock's like documents, which is like the dream, right? Right. So she got to go through all the archives and um, what she found as she was reading the, uh, the autobiography that's published was that the publisher or editor had really cut out a lot of Anna Comstock's voice and a lot of her personality out of it. And so, and he really loved her husband, John Comstock. So he focused a lot on who she was as Mm -hmm. her, as his wife. So Mm -hmm. um, she went back and like brought a lot of that voice back. And as I was reading that last Christmas, I think um, she actually talks about what a failure (laughs) the notebooks were back when they released them. She just said that uh, her and Agassi's really expected teachers to see them as um, a tool that would be easy, you know, for them to give to their students and have them consume and have something to show for what, because I think that's in the public school system, you have to have something to show for nature study, you know, so this was something that they wanted to give to them to do that. And it, um, it tanked. So that's why they were never published again after that and why they're so difficult to find. Um, but I think the, uh, all the work that they were doing back then, even though, you know, and it's like, 25 years of work of them trying to get public schools to adopt this method. Um, it failed ultimately, you know, the, um, if you look at public school now, they're not gardening and they don't have beautiful grounds and things like that, which is what Bailey was working for. Um, but I think the homeschooling community has really taken grasp of this idea of nature study. And so trying to bring them back now to people who are already kind of looking 
uh, for something like this instead of trying to, you know, push it into uh, an already made agenda, I think they would do better now, which is why I wanted to bring them back. Yeah, and we're so glad you did. And they are doing better. I see that they're constantly like top sellers in their categories on Amazon. Yeah, they're doing well. People seem to like them. Even in the homeschool community, people I struggle with not having something to show for Mm -hmm. our work. So that's an excellent idea to... Yeah. And what I really love about them, I'll show you guys a little bit. So this is the first one that I found. And this was just like an estate sale find, which is like the dream, right? That you go in and find (laughs) find something amazing that nobody's ever seen before. So um, what's cool about it, like, obviously, I recognize immediately what it was and who had written it. Um, And then the back had like a lit, a partial list of other notebooks. So once I found the first one, I was like, Oh, I've got to start looking for the others. So I get on eBay and do the you know search alert for the uh, the illustrator and for the author and Nature Notebook series, which is funny because I get like notebook series is also a keyword for like computer stuff. So I get emails every single day, new products in Nature Notebook series, but it's always computer stuff and hardly ever anything from this. But it was worth it because I did end up finding most of the books. There's one more, I think uh, there's. Moth and Butterflies, which I would love to have, but never have seen it. Like, I don't know if it really existed, if they just stopped printing them. And then there was another that was Zoo Animals. And I have the illustrations for Zoo Animals because Agassi's, um, I'll show you these two. He actually released them as plates for like coloring for children. So I was able to get the illustrations that he would have used for the Zoo Animals notebook, but I don't have the content from inside the um, thing. So... You so know, we all need to keep our eyes open for moths yes, and butterflies always, yes. and zoo animals. Yeah. Zoo animals and moths and butterflies, yeah. Um, and I wonder, you know, some of the, like the animal notebook, um, the first one that I found, it's just the questions from the Handbook of Nature Study, the same exact content that she would have asked in the, you know, the series of questions that she asks her students. So I wasn't sure when I was looking for the others, I wasn't sure if they were all going to be exactly the same. And Luckily, they're not. There's a lot of cool content and all of them are different. They have different contributors. Um, So that's been fun to kind of research some of the other people. Um, And the illustrator, Agassiz, is actually, he did the illustrations. Well, I don't know if he did it for Burgess, but the Burgess animal and Burgess bird um, are both illustrated by Luis Agassiz Fuertes, who did the ink outlines in the back of all of the notebooks. Actually, this one doesn't have a back of the notebooks. Um, so like the bird ones, he did all the outlines. Oh, very pretty. And they're pretty cool. Yeah. And, and it's, those, those are different sorry. from the stippled in- illustrations. So the stippled is only in the insect book. And, um, the you know, there's a lot of insects. And I think that they were just trying to, the um, illustrator for this, I don't remember if it's Ada Georgia No, Cornelia Kephart. So the illustrator for this one is different than the others. And she did, I'm going to hold this up close so you can kind of see them. She made these really light, like Mm -hmm. stippled. So um, the reason it says in the front of the book is because there's so many insects, they couldn't put all of them in there. And so they did like light outlines so that you could kind of just have um, some guidance. If you found something similar, you would be able to draw in the details yourself instead of having like a all the other ones are like very thick black outlines of Mm -hmm. a very definite thing you know but the insect one is stippled so I feel like those would be be very confidence building for kids Mm -hmm. that are new to nature drawing and feeling kind of overwhelmed yes I I mean for me it's very confidence building to have a lot of like (laughs) guidance going through and um the uh I've seen a lot of people even like you know they buy one nature notebook and then the whole family uses just that notebook and so they all get their note their blank notebooks next to it and kind of use the outlines as an example of how to draw the certain parts yeah. of the bird or whatever it might be yeah, yeah. so do just so for our sake for copyright because this is public domain are mm-hmm. you allowed to do that I know a lot of consumables, you're only allowed to use the consumable once. You can't share it for a whole family with the copyrights. Um, I mean, I don't have any kind of uh, rules about the copyright for it. You know, with public domain, you can't really protect that yeah. content much anyway. Um, and 
I'm, I really want families to use it. So I'm not that concerned if they buy one and use their blank notebooks to draw on their own. Um, well, great. Yeah. <laughs> so are these primarily suited for North America then? Yes. Yeah, they are. Um, the notebooks, I would say the handbook, I would say, yes, it's suited to North America, but I think that the method needs to be learned and known everywhere. <laughs> you know, I think that she has a really solid um, idea of what nature studies should look like. And the introductory chapter lays it out pretty well. And even the, if you just read the chapters through, you'll see her method in play, which is uh, first she tells a story, something that's personal to her. Um, so we shouldn't mimic her story. We should tell our kids our own stories or ask them if they have a story to share. Um, and then the observation and then um, asking a lot of curiosity sparking questions and then documenting your answers when you find those through mm -hmm. your observation or asking an expert or looking in your books, that kind of thing. A lot of the questions can be answered in the notebooks just by looking in the handbook of nature study. The answers are there. So um, that's helpful to me. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, mostly she wants the kids to be doing their own work, their own research and observing on their own to be able to answer their questions. And even if that takes a long time, I really don't one of the, when um, I'd done another interview on these, I really pushed like, I don't want people to think they get the notebooks and they try to complete them. It's kind of this lifelong companion to fill it out. Every time you see a cardinal, mm -hmm. write about it. Every time you come across a cardinal in literature, put a quote in there. You know, it's not one of these things where you race to the end and try to have this finished this project. Your, your fifth grade project. You're not going to just yeah, do it. Yeah, right. And I think it's hard too, because, you know, like Ambleside has these kind of arbitrary lists of what we study when. And so mm -hmm. you want to try and cover that subject um, really thoroughly over that time, which is great. I don't think that's a bad plan just for the sake of thoroughness. Um, but I, you get kind of like, okay, we're done with rocks. Now we're doing spiders. And, you know, it, nature doesn't work like that. Children don't work like that. It's kind of this like blending of life all day, every day, you're kind of seeing different things and you can't really plan for what you're going to. I mean, I, people do plan, you know, there's lots of curriculums that are like, we're studying apples this week only. It's all apples. Right. Um, but for us, it's just been kind of like something new shows up every day and mm -hmm. we just see it, so, observe it, talk about it. And then it's a lifelong friend. So it's not so like, um, so planned and structured. Like so that. would you recommend kind of like a book of centuries where you keep it for your whole life? Would you recommend keeping these over multiple years? Yes. Just yeah, adding so. to them. And just the, you know, having them be kind of, um, you go to them when you have time to go to them. I don't really assign them like you have to work on your nature study book mm -hmm. three times a week or at this certain time. It's more, um, you know, we're just kind of living our lives. And then when we have time or when we really want to remember something, we'll run back and use the notebooks and, you know, jot down whatever it is that we saw or want to remember. Yeah. So to start using them, you would use them hand in hand with the handbook of nature study. Is that correct? Or could you I just think you don't system? necessarily have to. Um, I do think you need to kind of understand the philosophy a little bit before you jump into the Nature Notebook series, which is, you know, that's always kind of the difficult part is convincing someone to change their philosophy is kind of the hard part. But uh, it's mostly so in the beginning of the books is like a little bit of educational material. So like, uh, where's my big books? The, um, the bird book just has like... Um, an outline with all the parts labeled, and then that's it. There's not any other educational information. And then there's forms to fill out. So you don't necessarily have to have um, the handbook of nature study or be familiar with Comstock's philosophy and all of that. I just think it helps to not, you know, steer it in that direction of like really trying to work through each thing and answer everything that day. Um, you know, <laughs> does that yeah, make sense? That does make sense. No one's grading you for completeness on this? Not at all. <laughs> so if someone is looking at improving their nature study, where do you recommend they start? Oh, improving their nature study. Um, well, so for me, it was really getting to know Anna Comstock and Bailey's uh, like philosophy. And I also, where's my, let me see. 
I have more uh, stuff out here than I should have brought. Okay, so nature study idea. This is um, Bailey's work on nature study and his, like, this really gives you a good picture of what it is, what it isn't, who started the term, why they started the movement, are you equipped to be a nature study teacher, that kind of thing. And then in the back of it, um, there are questions and answers, and they're really helpful, I think, to the nature study educator. If you're struggling to, like, enforce, uh, enforce is a strong word, but if you're struggling to get your kids outside, you're kind of struggling through your um, to incorporate object it. lessons, that kind of thing. I think that the, the question and answer in the back of this book is going to be really helpful because um, it's public school teachers who are kind of having all the same questions that we would have, you know, am I well equipped enough? Um, is this going to be thorough enough? Um, and just really encouraging. I think the whole book is really encouraging to the um, teacher. If you're, if you don't already love doing it, I think that that book would be really helpful. And I think the introductory chapter of the handbook is really helpful too. Um, you know, it depends on what your struggle is. So if you're struggling because you don't want to do it and you don't really like nature study and you, you don't think that it would be a benefit to you or your family, um, read the introductory chapter. There's a part about what nature study does for the teacher. So there's parts about what it does for the student, but there's also one part that's about what it does for the teacher. And I think that any of us can probably say, yes, we do feel our nerves are lacerated. And yes, it is hard to like have this long list of things that mothers have to do every day and try and squeeze something else into it. Um, but Bailey will kind of come along and say, nature study is not just an extra um, subject to be added. It's kind of this, um, what does he say? I think he says it's like an, a philosophy that's like stating its place. So He's saying, like, we're already kind of doing it. Um, we just don't recognize it as right. That. That's very cool. I saw that at Christmas you bought yourself a biography on Bailey. Did, Did you yeah. Enjoy it? I didn't even know it existed, so I was excited about that. I've flipped through it, and I've read quite a bit of it. Um, I'm not, I'm a terrible reader. I'm always like, I'm going to pick this up here. And what, what am I interested in researching today? And I don't read a lot of things fully all the way through every time. But um, I liked the author did, I thought did a good job of, um, it's just not very dry. You, I mean, I could tell he took some like artistic liberty of like making, um, like having this pretend conversation or a conversation that happened, but he's just kind of like, you know, writing it as if he was in the room, uh, which I like. It was it was interesting. And I learned a lot about him um, that I didn't know. So are you considering printing that one? Um, I can't print that one. It's still it's in copyright. copyright. I think it was written. He died in like the 50s. And okay. so I think that one is still in copyright. But yeah, I, I would love to do something that has um, like I think the so we were talking about earlier about the um, the friendship between Tolkien and Lewis and how people are just like so drawn to the friendship and relationship mm -hmm. between like those kind of types of figures. And I think that Bailey and Comstock and all the crew that started the nature study movement, um, there's just something so fascinating to me about their relationships. And if you read the correspondence between all of them, it wasn't just like, um, uh, it's really hard to explain. Like they're all kind of idealists. So they're really working towards something they really believe in. Um, and they, they adore Bailey and just the letters that they write to him and what was written about him at his, on his birthdays, they would have like ceremonies and people like Teddy Roosevelt wrote a letter to him on like celebrating wow. him. And um, he just had a big fan base. And so it's funny to me that Comstock in our world gets so much recognition when really he was the heart of it all. And so I'd love to do something that kind of introduced him to our world and the homeschool world and kind of, um, and I think he has a lot to say to help educators too. So I'd love to have something out there but yeah, seven kids and homeschooling and writing, you know, you guys know how it is trying to balance all the, that yeah, stuff. Hey, that's beautiful. How treasured he was. Yeah, it really is. So you, you spoke of the golden age of nature study and this movement that they had. Mm. Could you tell us some more about that? Yeah. I mean, I, we kind of touched a little bit already with, as far as like, we say golden age, but it was hard work. I think that they really had a task ahead of them. And um, 
I think having, uh, it's funny in his, I think it's in his biography, Comstock says that he could have rounded up stumps and stones and encouraged, like brought them to the cause because he was such that type of person. Um, and he was, uh, he was a hard worker all the time. And I don't like, I don't know how he did everything in a day's time, the kind mm-hmm. type of person. Um, and so him being this driving force and then them going through years and years of doing all this to kind of get the nature study movement working. I feel like now is more the golden age of nature study because we can look back on these pioneers and we can see, you know, all we can see the history of what public school has done and how it's changed and whether or not it was influenced by it and kind of adopt it now. And so we, we have the benefit of that. I don't, I don't know that I would call that the golden age back then just because it's um, it was like the grittiness of, of that. And it was all, you know, it was all new. Yeah. A pill for them too. It reminds me of that saying that says the best time to plant a tree was a hundred years ago. And the second mm. best time is today. Yeah. And so they, they planted that tree for us a hundred years ago. Right. And now we get to eat the fruit of it and exactly, yeah. it in our own families. Are there any people who have stood out to you besides Liberty and Anna and John as people that were really beneficial that people just don't know about or aren't reading about or talking well, that's about? That's a good but- question. Um, so, uh, I mean, John Spencer, who I mentioned before, I think that's someone, uh, Pinder St. Clair, who wrote, who republished the autobiography. Um, she was very, I watched an interview with her and she was like, he's slipping through the cracks. Nobody's going to know who he is. And if we don't do something, you know, if we don't do the research now and bring him back. And I want to tell you what's cool about him was, um, so he was referred to as Uncle John. And he had thousands of people, children, writing to him, and he would write them back. And so there's plenty of correspondence to look on. Um, and he was a farmer, so these kids would write him with their questions about their plants that they're trying to grow, that kind of stuff, and then he would respond. And I think that was part of like a junior natural uh, like magazine or some kind of subscription. Um, so it's out there, but it's we're losing, you know, we're getting to the point where people are – most people haven't even heard of Bailey, so they're not going to hear of his sidekick, you know, but um, yeah, he's somebody who there's not anything out there that you can find by him, but hopefully somebody at Cornell is digging through the archives and going to bring something back for us. So can you, could you tell me about the intersection between the nature study? And I saw there were agricultural type questions in one of the books. Um, Is there, I'm very interested in that because sometimes we have time <laughs> nature study, but we can go out and see the sheep in our field. Right. Okay. So what's the question? The intersection between an intersection agriculture between and nature study? Agriculture and nature study in those works and in those people's work? Um, I, I would say absolutely. I mean, um, so all of them were like in the field. So when, when they started the school, um, which they – they started, Bailey was, Bailey and Comstock like dug the soil of where the building stands now for the agricultural school there. Um, so I think as far as like children learning agriculture, is that kind of your question? I'm not sure. Just tell me. <laughs> <whatever you know. laughs> I'm trying to, I, I know that that's something like, um, so the farmers kind of scoffed at the word like agricultural school and like this, the the educational world and that kind of stuff. And so Bailey was really trying to bring the university out into the farm um, Mm -hmm. was really his, I mean, he had a lot of goals. (laughs) So one of the things that he wanted to do was just to um, be a help to the people and to the, to the citizens around him. And so um, bringing up kids to garden and, and there was this weird, like, I mean, I don't think nowadays this is the case, but maybe it is. But back then, like being a child of a farmer was something to be ashamed of. And um, so he really wanted to kind of make this shift, not just so that children would enjoy nature and find joy in it, but also that they would like find identity in their heritage and also to become farmers themselves because what was happening was there's this um pull from rural areas everybody's trying to go to the city and get better jobs and you know work their way out of this shameful existence i guess and he really wanted them to kind of 
adopt it as something to be proud of and something to mm-hmm. continue doing. And um, I do think, um, you know, he's been influential enough in in those ways uh, that that's that's true today. I don't think most people are like, you know, worried about the fact that their parents are farmers or trying to get out of the small town and move to the city. We're kind of seeing a shift. Um, and I think especially since the pandemic, too, people are really interested in homesteading and families are really getting uh, wanting to be more self-sufficient. And that was that was part of the so because the state was paying Comstock and Bailey and uh, Spencer um, like large sums of money to do this program. It really started, if you read the, not the introductory, but the preface of the Handbook of Nature Study, it talks about this, um, people were going to the cities to get food from food banks because there's, people are not like farming their land properly and they don't know how to do it. And so it's kind of this combination of like the state seeing a problem and trying to put people in place to go out to the farms to get them to be more self-sufficient so they're not um, Mm. relying on going back to the city. So there's a lot going on in this nature study uh, world. I wish somebody would make a movie about it or something so that we could kind of like get a feel for what it was like back then. But It sounds like that would make a very interesting movie. It reminds me of in Emma where Emma is thinking so lowly of the farmer that's courting her friend and (laughs) Mr. Knightley puts her back in her place and it's basically like it's honorable work. He's an honorable man. Right. I'm honored to call him a friend. So wow. Yeah. I just see that correlation. So with the um, John Spencer, was Mm -hmm. that the farmer with the letters? It just immediately in my mind, I'm like, somebody needs to make a picture book and it's epistolary. Like it could just be letters (laughs) back and forth with all these kids. Yeah, I agree. That's been kind of my like experience. You know, it started with just finding these notebooks and the more that I dug into the notebooks and the con- the contributors and then finding out about Bailey and um, just doing all the research. It's like every day I was researching, someone else would come up that's contributed something that I'm like, people need to know that this exists. So that's been kind of a fun uh, treasure hunt. Um, there's one book that, and the great thing about all of these people was, um, you know, they were true educators. They really were bringing other people up not just children, but other, all the people that they worked with, they were always trying to get them to write, trying to get them to publish, um, and really uh, treasuring their contributions to the work. So one thing I've been trying to work on is a, uh, it's like a songbook that's written for children and Comstock encouraged this, I don't know, she's a piano teacher or something that had like a songbook for children that are like, um, just nature, you know, crickets and birds and things like that. So, um, I don't know anything about like making sheet music. I'm a graphic designer, but sheet music is not my thing. So I've been trying to figure out how to like get that published because it's really sweet. Yeah, we should talk more about that. My sister's a professional um, violinist and she's a music teacher and she would totally love to work on that project with you. She's getting ready to go back to school to get the certification that she needs to teach in public schools. Mm. She's so torn. <clears throat> excuse me, um, because she said that she goes into her daughter's school, her daughter goes to a private school, and she's like, I just go in, Amber, and I look at these teachers, and they're so busy, and they're just, you know, working all morning with the kids and all afternoon, and then they have to do all this stuff for school in the evening, and I was talking to Ruby's teacher, she has not even gone out to see the pelicans on the river yet, <laughs> <laughs> my sister would love your project, so. yeah, she would, that, yeah. She would. it sounds like it, that's funny, I'd love to get you to in touch, but I do what are your feelings on the picture book biography that was written on Anna did you feel that it was a good reflection of her life um you know I flipped through that I don't remember being super impressed I don't hurt anybody's feelings um but not because you know I think it was just written to be inspiring to children and to have this figure I think that she was such a dynamic person and had so many different um, talents. And um, I would have loved to see a lot of her. The the illustrations are beautiful, but I didn't see a lot of like her Anna's work in it. And, you know, my kids are age from like two to 15. And um, I think they would have enjoyed seeing some more like uh, uh, they do enjoy seeing because they have it here in the house everywhere. But there's a lot of um, 
when I try to republish things or write things about people, um, I really try to use a lot of their own content. So like, uh, I started working on Handbook right before Living Book Press published all of theirs, and I gave up because theirs are beautiful, and I just didn't have the time. But when I was making the cover, I made sure to include Agassi's work and um, Anna's sketches and that kind of stuff, and and they're beautiful. So I'm like, why would you change that? But you know, yeah. different yeah. creative differences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish that she had a biography in like the Messner biography series. Mm, yeah. There, there are some good horticulturists covered in that, um, you know, because it's hard to get all that information that you're talking about into a picture book biography. Right. Like those those earlier biographies that Messner and um, mm-hmm. Britannica were putting out. I really like the, the Luther Burbank was a horticulturist and they have a really good biography on him in the Britannica bookshelf series. Mm. I just like, I wept at the end of that one because... Um, he was just such a gentle soul. And then mm. his words were taken by the press and twisted mm. and it hurt a relationship that he had with someone else. And it just, it completely broke him that, that event. And so they're really good. Um, the biography is just looking deeply into someone's life. So I hope that someone yeah. writes one on Anna and one for kids on, on Liberty as well, or maybe just one about that time period. And So for those watching, wondering why everyone is in new clothes, and those listening, wondering why everything sounds a little glitchy right here, we had a major technical difficulty where all of the internet in my neighborhood went down for about an hour yesterday. So Kelly graciously has come back today, and we are going to finish our conversation. So the end of my thought, where I think we probably cut out, was I was saying that I really hope that somebody writes some really good biographies on Anna and Liberty for the middle grade readers and high schoolers, because I found other horticulturist books that I've read to be really inspiring and their lives aren't just about nature. There's so many other things that they're interested in and Mm. involved in and the relationships that they had with other people like Luther Mm -hmm. Burbank's book, he was writing a whole bunch of people in a whole bunch of fields and having these really informed conversations about, a myriad of issues. So I really hope somebody writes those. And then my follow-up question to something that you said earlier. Oh, one thing you had mentioned the book by the Inklings that's coming out. And I just wanted to say that um, Hendrix is doing that for people that were wondering. John Hendrix is this amazing illustrator. If you haven't seen his work, you should definitely look it up, but he's the one that's illustrating and doing the Inklings book. And I'm really excited about that. I've yeah, been, that's been watching it on Instagram as he's been showing more pages. It's super, super beautiful. But is there a name? I don't know if you guys know, is there a name for that kind of genre of like, like people who knew each other, like relationally, um, like throughout history, you know, something like that. The Inklings are like, we were talking about these group of people who are working together is that like a have its own special name or anything do you know I I don't know I Mm. find it fascinating though I find it fascinating the more I discover people who had influence in areas where you just don't hear about them but they were Mm -hmm. strong influences in someone's life my um, 15 year old and I I'm sure I've mentioned this before and I'll probably mention again we watch Hamilton a lot and Mm. It's like our bedtime ritual is we'll just watch the next couple songs as she's winding down before she goes to bed. And so because of that, we've done this huge deep dive into Mm. Hamilton and Burr's life. And that's just been fascinating. And I would love to talk about that in a different podcast. But one of the I'll get my daughter to talk to you about that because she loves that. like her area. Yeah. You can have her and Inara have a great discussion. Oh my goodness, Um, she would die. (laughs) But we we had so what we do every time we once once we've watched it through we, and we started doing just a couple songs, we would take those couple songs and do a deep dive into the history on what really happened and what these songs are referencing. Because, for example, at the end, when he writes Burr, his 30 years of issues that he's had with him, he didn't write that to Burr, but he did do that to somebody else. So that mm. is a historical thing that Alexander did. Just they took some liberties there. So yeah. one of... One of the things that we found really fascinating was Eliza's sister, Angelica, really wrote letters to everybody. She really was 
brilliant. And the Library of Congress has all these letters back and Mm. forth between her and all the founding fathers. So here's this woman who, until this play, nobody even knew existed in our Mm. generation, who really challenged what they were thinking and challenged what they were planning to do in the founding of our country. And so I just, I really like those little pods and especially discovering how many women were in Mm -hmm. these pods that had huge influence just quietly behind the scenes. Yeah. But that's very, very fun to, to think about and learn about and discuss. It is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been such an interesting thing as I, you know, getting really into handbook of nature study and then kind of learning about the person of Anna Comstock and then learning about her team and then learning so much about Bailey has been like, it's just kind of this ongoing, um, like there's just new revelations all the time. Like you said, it's like he was, Bailey was involved in so much and uh, connected with a lot of people. Um, in the biography, it said um, he had to buy like a buggy because he was so high in demand to do like lectures and things <laughs> that he bought a buggy and it was broken and he took it to get fixed. And then later on in the, he found out that it was Henry Ford. That was the mechanic that he took oh, it wow. to. So he loved telling that <laughs> Henry Ford was like fixed his buggy. So it's that kind of stuff that just like yes. the way that you like can kind of start making connections of where they were and at what period of time and that kind of stuff is cool. Yeah, I feel like everything that I learn about new just needs a huge storyboard where it's like this yeah. screen goes to here, you know, one, of, one of those conspiracy boards. I was just going to say, like, yeah. these are the real connections. <laughs> these are the real things that were going on. That's so funny. Right. So you mentioned that Anthony at Living Book Press had republished the Handbook of Nature study. Mm-hmm. And am I correct? Didn't he do it in smaller bites? So it's not just a, a giant right. yeah. tome? It's like, I think it's seven or eight volumes. Um, that are like all. And so I think I've seen your notebooks on his website. So if somebody wanted to get this, the handbook and your notebooks, they could just one stop. Right. Yeah. So that happened. um, I sell on Amazon and they don't print or sell in Australia or they didn't when, when he contacted me. So, um, so we went ahead and worked together to try and get some volumes yeah. available there which now they're amazon can sell in, in australia now anyway but it just is awesome to be able to support his work too and for us to work together it was a really great experience so yeah i think it's great for the community to be able to see both pieces side by side mm, as well yeah. and know that you can you can have that resource available that right a lot of people that know about the handbook probably still are just discovering the notebook. Yeah, that's been that. an interesting part of the business is like, you know, I love the research and I love de- uh, doing the designs of the books and all of that. And the formatting is all great, editing it. But the um, the marketing side of it, which is funny, that was the that was the group's problem too, was like get convincing people that it's something that's worth yeah. paying attention to is, is most of the work. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, you think you're done and you get, uh, I got all seven books done and designed and formatted and then it was like oh now I have to tell people about it so I'm thankful that you guys are asking because there's not a lot of places where you can go kind of meet people who know what you're even talking about yeah I've I've been fascinated watching your whole process of going through and I was so excited the first time you said I'm gonna look into reprinting these I was like that's awesome because otherwise all it is is this oh I'm happy for somebody that found something rare to auction right. but yeah. I can't can't really get behind letting people know it exists because right they no one else is gonna find it. one <laughs> yeah, it, it took me a couple of years just like learning design programs and stuff like mm-hmm. that I have a little bit of background in graphic design but it was like uh it was a lot of of work trying to figure out how to get it done and get it printed that I contacted so many like you know I really wanted to support a local printer and it was I mean, I would have had to charge like $50 per paperback notebook if I would have gone that route. And that's not an exaggeration. And um, and I would have had to store everything in my home and mm-hmm. ship it myself. So when I came across Amazon's option to publish and print through Amazon and have it be available worldwide, and it was only going to be 10 bucks a notebook, I was like, sorry, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm going to yep. go that route. So yeah. um, then having Living Book Press come alongside and know the background of like how to print things and get things available to people, um, that just helped keep the cost of everything down a lot and be, and be able to support another printer as well. So that was good news. Yeah. 
that that is good. I love I love seeing people that I appreciate what they're doing working together. Yeah, it's been a cool. Uh, there's like a couple different publishers, and there's been a little bit more and more, and it's been a very like not com. Not, it's not competitive, and everybody's kind of doing their own thing, and it's all different enough to not you know, it's not a competition between any of us. We're kind of rooting for each other. And, you know, if I see something that like, I know I'm not going to republish children's picture books or things like that, but I'll, I'll send, Hey, I found this book. Here's a publication or yeah. here's an illustrator that I think you should look into uh, with purple house. And um, Jody Skinner is doing um, smidgen press now. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of cool stuff going on with people who are kind of getting into the republishing. And I love that. It's not just the, um, I feel like this this world that we're in, it's people who really love it and are doing it artistically and beautifully and well done and um, not just, you know, a scanned copy of like an ugly cover and that kind of stuff. So that's been cool to work alongside people who are doing it right. (laughs) Passion projects are different. (laughs) So yeah. you're making your own little pod and maybe yeah. in 100 years we'll all people will be talking yes, about 100 how years you from all now. <laughs> <laughs> so fun. amanda and i were speaking yesterday afternoon and she's like amber i got to talk to kelly while we were waiting to see if your internet would come back up and we have to talk about what i was talking to her about so amanda what what exactly were you guys yeah, disgusting. I was so interested in how you do nature study, and I felt you like you had a lot of really good tips for how to um, make it fit into a normal life. And so, oh yeah, you tell us about how you how you approach nature study in your own home. Yes, yeah. So I, I'll first start with like what we did first. So, um, I, like I said, we did Ambleside. So in the beginning, it's like, all right, we're jumping in in this season and this month, this is what we're studying for Ambleside. So I'd open up to rocks and minerals and I'd read all the content to my children. And then I would quiz them with all the questions that are in the book, which is like not enjoyable for anyone. You know, (laughs) that was just a mess. And we always felt like we were doing it wrong. And then, um, then I went back and read the introductory chapter, which is like, here's how you do it. And here's how you don't do it. And so that was really helpful to me. And um, also a pocket full of pine cones um, by Karen Andriola is very, um, it just kind of walks through it's like a memoir of like how she incorporated nature study on a mm-hmm. daily basis was helpful too um, so so how we do nature study now is very um, just natural you know we, we live in Florida which is like everywhere is green there's plants that you can't even stop from growing um, we just moved into a new house and it's like both of our fences are lined with there's lantana and jasmine and um, like the beautiful passion flower across one and there's elderberry in the back. It's just like you can't get away from it basically in Florida. So um, but our the, the thing we started with was birds, <laughs> which is like there's birds everywhere, whether you're in the city or the country. Um, and we go out. Uh, our new house has this deck upstairs uh, outside of my master bedroom. And after my baby, who's two, goes down, I take the other two middles, who are four and eight, and we just sit out on the deck at night before bed, and we watch to see what birds come by. There's bats sometimes. Um, They watch if a spider out there has, um, you know, has trapped something in its web, that kind of thing. And it's never, I don't do any kind of like, today we're going to study this thing, um, and we're going to go to the library and get 15 books about reptiles and amphibians it's more um we're just outside a lot and whatever we see sparks their interest if they have more questions we put them in their notebooks um and we do like uh we do have books about nature and they do enjoy reading them but um i don't usually do like an assigned nature time so um and i like i was when we were talking when we were cut off um yesterday um comstock's method has really like helped me as an educator in all types of ways, um, especially the questions, asking all the questions. Um, Mm -hmm. Because I think when we see that list in the book, uh, it's kind of intimidating because it's a lot of information to take in and you feel like you have to have the right answer. Um, But I've started just using that method as like not expecting an answer. So Mm -hmm. as we're, I was telling her, as we're baking, I'll ask a bunch of questions about why we put those ingredients in or what would they do differently? And how do they think, what would happen if we tried this instead of that kind of thing? And you can do that method in any scenario, whether you're working on a car or whatever you're doing, um, just really involving the child into a conversation where 
it's not, you're not quizzing them. You're just kind of saying, I wonder this. And then yes. they have the opportunity to see someone else being curious. And then they naturally start mm -hmm. asking questions of their own and looking for the answers there. And oh, there's so much that's more. what nature study looks like at our house. It's not anything like, you know, we don't have like displays of uh, like all the butterflies or, you uh -huh. know, drawing out charts of um, different species and families and that kind of thing. Um, it's all very just. Uh, and my four year old, I was telling you guys before that uh, because we have two kind of pods of children, some are older, some are younger. The younger ones who have kind of been in that environment are so funny because it's it's a bonding thing for us. They will come to me with every single thing that they find and they want to show me everything that they see. And mom, did you see that bird? I think it was a green heron. You know, they're very uh, like interactive with it, with me and with each other, which is super fun. That is fun. Have you talking about birds? Have you guys had a chance to look at or play the game wingspan? No. We, so I'm, we're so just fun. getting into like, everybody's interested in playing games. So yeah. I will look into that. Matt and Amanda come over on Friday nights with their girls and we um, they come over in the afternoon and we work on the, the website and the literary database and putting the podcast episodes together. And then in the evening, the girls make dinner, all of the girls, because we eat basically the same thing every Friday night. So That's the, girls, awesome. the girls are on their little, little, you know, autopilot and they make dinner and we eat and then the kids all go play and the adults play games. So it's been great for um, our family, especially. We started doing this a few years ago when we first felt like our heads were coming above water from being in just constant survival mode with all mm. the autism diagnoses that were happening and getting kids to a place where they weren't having screaming meltdowns. So it was just really mm. healthy for us to have adult right. friends that we could yes. talk to about adult things. And I wasn't just with children all day and then just, you know, getting through the bedtime rituals with my husband at night. So mm. um, Amanda's husband wanted Wingspan. Was it his birthday gift last year or Christmas? Uh, well, it was one of those things where I wanted it for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even better. So Matt I knew he'd it. like that. Matt so got I bought it for it. his gift. Yes. So Matt's brain is very game oriented. Like mm -hmm. he, um, Amanda's mentioned, cards. Amanda's has mentioned before memorized. that he um, has dyslexia. And so one of the strengths that he had to counteract the challenges was just memorizing everything the first time he mm -hmm. saw it as mm -hmm. a kid, which means now he's a card counter. And so there's yes. a lot of games that we don't like playing with him because <laughs> he knows what everybody has. It's not right. a lot of fun. Yeah. But this one is a lot of fun because yes. you can't count anything and it's all just everybody building their own little habitat for the birds. And so you have your little nests with your eggs and you have your wetland birds and, and each card, they're so beautifully illustrated. Mm. The whole game is just aesthetically pleasing and there's and, so many of them yeah and, and then there's expansion packs so packs. if you're not in the states you can do like the australian the, oh, the oceania birds I'm there's sorry, little Amanda. facts about the little birds mm -hmm. and on the bottom my kids would card. love that so, yeah so really each fun. bird like it has like what its wingspan is and so if you are collecting the predator birds then it'll say you know in this turn flip up a card and if the wingspan is less than this you can eat it and so then <laughs> Amanda's <laughs> husband has this like sound that he does every time oh, he's like, around like eating a bird in his pile <laughs> Oh, that sounds fun. But yeah, it's it's a fun game for like older kids and I'm sure younger kids that are playing with older kids mm. would catch on to it pretty quickly. Oh but yeah. Yes. For adults, it's it's really enjoyable and it's just so pretty. Yeah, <laughs> so. that sounds like it. I think I've seen it. Is it like bright colors? I mean, yeah, like it's like bright, bright, bright like tropical bright birds. Water color pastels. Yeah. It, it has um I think it has like a barn swallow on mm. the front. So it's like the big it, it's a it's a swallow, but it's thing. not a barn yeah, swallow. A barn. It's a, <laughs> the prettier one. It's a prettier one. <laughs> mm. A lot of colors. But I feel like every time we play, we like flip a card and we're like, oh, I didn't know that bird existed. And then we're all like yep. interested in reading about the bird and sharing about it. So yeah. it's like an adult yeah. indoor nature study. <laughs> right? Yeah. We have a, our pastor of our last church was a hunter. And I remember the first time we all got together, um, he was talking about like the rush of like once you've shot the animal and he would like drop his bag and like lose it and not remember where he was because he was so like adrenaline from you know seeing and being able to make the shot and i was telling him like bird 
watching is kind of like that. Like you get so pumped up that you see something that everything stops and you have to be quiet and you have to like yeah. figure out what it is. And I, so, I don't think most people know that it's like a sport, you know, that it's like super fun and the kids enjoy it. So what's the coolest thing you found in Ooh. a nature study? Coolest thing we found. Uh, I think my kids would probably all agree that a dung beetle is probably their favorite thing. And they thought it was so fun because it actually had like a little ball that it was rolling around. Um, so they were pretty pumped about that. They also, I don't know why, I guess in Florida, we, we have pines, but they're not very, um, you can't climb them. Like I, when I was a kid, we had these huge trees in our front yard and there was like sap all over them. Mm -hmm. They get really excited about sap. <laughs> yeah, it might be Jurassic Park related. I don't know, but uh, they, they get excited about that. Um, we The house we just moved to, we just saw a redheaded um, skink or a, I can't remember what it's called, but it was like really large. We thought it was a big snake at first. Um, and it's like this huge lizard with a big, bright red head. So wow. that was new for us. Um, so and I love kingfishers. I get most excited like about kingfishers. Florida feels like it would be such a great place for nature study. It is. Because you it have really the whole is. year. <laughs> like right. in Iowa, at some point, it's like, it's winter. Yeah. We get, yeah. We get well, whoever that, shows yeah. up at the break. That's the great thing about Comstock, though, is like she did a lot of winter. And this is a fun fact from um, Liberty High Bailey had a dry garden that in the winter years or in the winter season, he would work on his dry garden, which was like oh. – um, like clippings from plants that he would document and like keep it. Um, it reminds me of in the on Parables from Nature. Have you guys read Parables mm -hmm. from Nature? There's like a story about the like creatures that are, you know, specimens in their little boxes in the library. So that's like his dry garden that he would work on, which I thought was an interesting, that is interesting. concept. But he was, after he was, um, the dean at Cornell and all of the accomplishments and everything that he did before retirement, after he retired, he ended up being like the lead researcher and he would like travel the world studying palms, mm. which is crazy. Like he yeah. had a whole nother life after retirement of he more accomplishments. Warm places, yeah. right? Our, our right. palms warm places. That's a good yeah, retirement. Yeah, right. So, and then, he, but he would bring back all of the stuff that he was studying and have his, uh, his dry garden of specimens. So. That's it. You can do it indoors. But I think, oh, I was saying Anna Comstock, because she lived in New York, uh, she has a lot of good advice on how to appreciate nature study in mm -hmm. winter. And I think especially winter trees, which I don't think I have my, uh, I republished one of her smaller books. It was actually published as a um, like newspaper article and the newspaper owned the rights to it, but she got them back and published it as like a gift. Um, it's really beautiful, little, like tiny little narrow book with these black and white photographs of winter, bare winter trees. So I know that um, a lot of people were like, you know, black and white pictures of bare winter trees are not <laughs> that appealing to look at, <laughs> you know, trying to look through her lens. I, I understood why she loved them. But when I republished, I used a different illustrator because um, mm -hmm. I just I thought that it would help people see, you know, that it actually is beautiful to look at bare right. winter trees and yeah. uh, helpful to um, the way she describes it is that like. Uh, relationally with the trees, they're not, they're not covered in all their garb and best, uh, you know, they're at their most vulnerable. And so you get to know them better, which is so beautiful, oh, but it it's just very short um, little essays about her love for trees, winter trees. Yeah, that is beautiful. Yeah. So you, you said that you don't use books and like have your children read them as part of their assignments. But beyond that, have you guys found nature books that you've found to be beautiful and just really enjoy. Yeah. So I love Jim Arnosky. Um, mm -hmm. I like, a, I just actually found, I have it here. Um, I found one of, I love the, um, there's one called the secrets of a wildlife watcher and I couldn't find oh. it to show it to you guys, but that's like one of the prettiest, most helpful, like practical in the field type of thing. And this one's similar. This one's called field trips, field trips, bug hunting, animal tracking, shore walking, and bird watching. And it's for um, teachers and students to kind of um, know what to look for and how yeah. to how to slow down and like look for these things and what to do if you do come across an animal. And um, it's just like always, be his stuff is always beautifully illustrated and just really helpful. 
He's the um, one that has the four books, one for each season as well. Those, I, uh, I think those are sketching books, right? Oh, sketching, sketches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sketching in autumn and spring. Yeah. 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 I, 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 really might have, I think I have one drawing in motion. This is another one of his too. So this is like how to draw animals that are moving step by step. Is that pretty? That's cool. I'm trying to think. Um, we also, I don't always, all, most of our stuff is going to be like old books because we go to like library discard sales and things like that. Um, newer, you know, if we have the big Animalium and Botanicums are beautiful, but those aren't really like story books. Um, I really like Joanna Gaines. Garden book was really sweet, um, really beautifully illustrated. And you could tell that it was like collaborative with her children because they, it'll be like, dad says, foundation is the most important part of the house and the same is true with the garden you have to take care of the soil kind of thing so I thought that was really sweet too um what else I'm trying to think other um had, uh, I think everything else is going to be old <laughs> it's all, it's all going to be stuff that people might not be able to find um this is an illustrator that I really like Suzanne Swain um And there's, I think she has a spider book too. So this is uh, insects. And then she also has spiders. And I, I have, a, have lot, a, little... a lot of science books from the 40s and 50s just because the illustrations are so amazing. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I guess uh, like <laughs> photograph became yeah. the most um, like sought after after a while. And I, I like photographs, but I do prefer, like we have our... Um, our field guides are Peterson, vintage Peterson guides, because the Audubon, I just felt like I don't, the, the photographs don't do anything for me, but I love the illustrations yeah. and the Peterson guides. So, yeah, I was listening to someone uh, maybe reading an article about someone learning to do wildlife illustrations and they were specific classes in, in their art school for wildlife illustrations because it was viewed as, very much a separate thing so I wonder Mm. if it's not being taught as much anymore Mm. yeah I don't know it's very interesting there's um there's one book oh talk about something else I'm gonna look up what this book is okay (laughs) I will tell you Kelly you're talking about there's birds everywhere but we live in Iowa on an acreage surrounded by monocropped crops so Mm. corn and soybeans we do not have birds oh we have some barn swallows, but we actually have to travel to like local state parks to really see birds. Mm. So, unfortunately, do your kids do well? Out. Like when we go out into the field to watch birds, I find that my children are like they're not as willing to be still long enough to watch. You know, if we see something fly by, they don't slow down and like wait to see what it is. When we're at home you know, they'll sit on the porch with me or they'll just wait or watch what's going on in the backyard and like be a little bit more focused. But when we go out to state parks, it's like, there's that, there's that mom, look at this. Let's jump out this log. You know, it's very, very active. But I guess, you know, my kids are young, so. It is more, our older daughter is better at it being still and stuff. But if we get off the beaten path enough at state parks, the birds tend to seem to be a little more, um, not as startled by humans Mm. so we have more luck then but the best book i found about nature for where we are in our monocropping culture is creek finding Mm. it is a book about it actually is about a person in northern iowa who had bought a property and it had a creek running through it but it had but he didn't know it when he bought it. It was just farmland. And he found a picture of it later and saw this creek and was surprised that there was this creek there. So he went to find it and he dug it out and restored the creek and a bunch of wildlife came back. It was all about different wildlife that sounds coming awesome. back. And it's a picture book and it's a true story. And that's awesome. it's gorgeous woodcut illustrations. Yeah, I would like to find that. <laughs> yeah. Oh. We, uh, that's Bailey says like a brook is the best place All year round. Find a brook and that's where you're going to have the best nature study. Really? Because that's where all the animals and plants mm. are drawn. You right. know, water, water is life and they mm-hmm. congregate. 
to yeah. it. So I found the book, but I can't talk about it because I realized if I start talking about it, I'm going to spend about 10 minutes because <laughs> I have like this whole train of thought. So I'm going to have to talk about that book at a different time. But okay. I did want to say that for me growing up, I always thought that nature was really useful for learning about life cycles and that, you know, the, like the whole experience of something dying like that's important for kids and I think in our culture we've done so much to shield our kids mm -hmm. from from that experience that's so much a part of life and yeah. do them a disservice I believe strongly <laughs> um but I think that in nature they can find that they can find those experiences and start working through those feelings and when when I was a kid we lived in the Chicago suburbs and the block that we lived on was right at the the line. So two houses down, you were in the next town. And so for some reason, the way the lot had gotten zoned was it was like a double block in length. And so it went around and there was this huge wooded lot in the middle of it. So completely rare in our area to just have this undeveloped lot. And so... My sister was talking to my kids about this the other day because she loved Rocks of Oxen. It's her favorite book her whole life. And she's like, you know, yeah, we basically had our own Rocks of Oxen when we were growing up behind the house. And my sisters are six, seven and seven years younger than me. So obviously I had better building of Rocks of Oxen stuff. And she's like, and, and your mom had the best little house going and she had like wood chips all laid out in front of it where she had this path and she mm -hmm. had the cemetery. And so thinking about the cemetery, we would find dead animals in this area. And my friend and I would cart them over to our cemetery. And then somebody had dumped sod back there. We would cover them in sod because we found that it, um, it sped up the decomposition. And then we could come back the next year and get their teeth which is what we wanted for making our jewelry to be part of our whole community life. Right? <laughs> so um, I think you need to write a book about this. Well, because there's, there is a book very similar to this, which I love, and it's called The Dead Bird. And <laughs> it's by Margaret Wise Brown. And these little kids are just outside. And it basically could be like Central Park. Like they're definitely in a big city in the Center Park area. And they find this little dead bird. And I thought that it just went through the process in a way that only Margaret Wise Brown can just so mm -hmm. simply write it. And it's like, but it had not been dead for long. It was still warm and its eyes were closed. The children felt with their fingers for the quick beat of the bird's heart in its breast, but there was no beating. And that's how they knew it was dead. And so just these little things like that is how we know people are dead. Like that's yeah. what we count is the heartbeat. And so it, they talk about the process of the body going into rigor and it's like the body got harder, its legs got stiffer and it no longer flopped when it moved. And so then they go and they have their little funerary experience of mm. burying the bird and they have a song that they sing to the bird, which is super cute. And I love, I love how simple little kids are. So here lies a bird that is dead. <laughs> it's, like, it's very very yeah. self-explanatory on the yeah. stone they wrote this and and then it, it talks about how they um and every day until they forgot they went and sang to their little dead bird and put fresh flowers on its grave and that's just part of the the grieving process right we do this and then we move on and it's not that we completely forget we just forget to do it every day and mm. so I love that book and it very much reminds me of my experience. I loved kid. hearing about your childhood experience. That's really fun. <laughs> I think that's something that's kind of, uh, you know, it's definitely kind of lost. Um, and I think as you grow up, you do forget, you know, like you said, your, your sister yeah. was telling the story. It's not something that you're thinking about. You don't wake up thinking I got to get to my community, right. to put my rocks out <laughs> or anything. So just to kind of remember, I, I think when I was saying before that, um, Comstock's method is first to tell a story that's exactly the kind of thing like they want to hear our experiences and what what affected us as children yeah. and it's interesting because uh, we don't have a lot of experiences anymore as adults you know you go through trying to find your career and having babies and all this and like all that uh, outdoor time that we used to spend just hours and hours um, observing and just being in our own world and making up fun stories and that kind of stuff uh just kind of disappears and so i think that 
bringing that back to the mom's heart is is good for the mom and good for the children also. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yep. Amanda does such a good job going to these wild and free sessions. She's going to one today where they just get out of nature with other families in the community and she keeps yeah. inviting me on rainy days and I'm just like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, actually, <laughs> even though we're in Florida, we don't, we're not beach people. We go to the beach when it's rainy because it's quiet mm -hmm. and we can dig around and observe and that kind of stuff and not be having all seven children in the dangerous ocean. You know, it's like right. we go on a rainy day. That's, that's our beach day. We don't, we don't visit the beach during the busy holiday times or anything like that. Sounds like a good solid plan. That's probably a locals tip, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't go on don't don't go on the sunny days. It's too hot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I've loved talking to you, Kelly, and I feel like we could just talk for hours, but we should probably just schedule another time to keep Yay! talking about all this fun <laughs> stuff. So I just want to thank you for being with us two days in a row now. Yes. And I'm glad to it thank our out. listening our listening community for sharing this time with us. So go ahead and look at our show notes to see links to any of the books that we've talked about and links to Kelly's shop where she has some beautiful nature study resources. And um, if you would like to support our podcast, you can follow and leave a review. And if you'd like to financially support keeping the podcast commercial free, then you can um, throw something in the tip jar. But remember the stories are truer than true. And go find some grass and take your shoes off and stick your feet in it. I'm sure ABC would approve. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs>